Bill Show coming to you live from Detroit, Michigan. Guys, we got an epic show for you today. This is going to be a lot of fun. We got a live audience with builders, remodelers. We got some builders first source people. And I've got two really smart builders with me on stage. We're going to be getting into remodel and new construction. What are some of the technologies that we take from both to help us in our businesses? Whether you're a builder, or a modeler, architect, whether you're thinking about building a house, we got a lot of good info for you today. Today's Build Show is sponsored by Builders First Source, live from Detroit. Let's get going. Hey, uh, let's send Matt in there so uh, he can start filming it. <laughs> All right, my friends, here we go. You boys ready? Let's do it. All right, let's do it. So, Build Show Live, we're coming to you from Detroit, Michigan. We're in some epically cool old building like there is a ton of down here in Detroit. And Brent and I actually got here a day or so ago so that we could kind of get a flavor for what's going on in Detroit. So first off, let me introduce the panelists. Uh, you probably know them already, but Brent Hull, my colleague from Fort Worth. Brent is the founder uh, and the owner of Hull Homes and Hull Millwork, two awesome companies based out of Fort Worth. And of course, Brent's shooting videos with us on buildshownetwork.com. But a new builder friend that we just met yesterday, Shane Overby, Overbay, Overby? Overby. Overby, uh, with Artisan Contracting. And Shane works right here in the city of Detroit. Uh, and Shane's got a really interesting background. We're gonna get into it in a little bit. But for those of you that are uh, zooming in on the call, I do wanna tell you that we're gonna answer some Q&A afterwards. So if you've got your Zoom open, if you wanna ask a question, the way to do it is to go to the Q&A tab. No one's monitoring chat, I won't be replying to you there, but if you post a question on q and I will be looking at those, and we're gonna try and leave at least you know, 15 minutes or so, 10 minutes for questions at the end. And I would tell you, if you're watching this later, if this is a recorded episode that you're watching, sign up on uh, whatever link is below us to sign up for our newsletter, because whenever we schedule these events, uh, we're sending out a link to these, and hopefully we're gonna do more and more of these, so maybe we'll come to your town someday. Uh, Builders First Source has, I think, three or four of these still in store for us later on this year. Uh, so look for that link to sign up for our newsletter so we can do more. With that being said, let's first watch a video that Brent and Shane, and, oh, I forgot to thank our sponsor, sorry. One other question, one other thing to say. Uh, Builders First Source tapped a bunch of their partners and uh, friends in the industry to help pay for this event because we got a lot of manpower, we got a lot of equipment, there was a lot of uh, logistics to put this on. So big thanks to all the Builders First Source sponsors that are up on the page now uh, that helped make this happen and, and make this live event uh, come together. So uh, let's transfer over and we've got just a real short video to kind of show you a flavor of what's happening here in Detroit and specifically what Brent and I saw in touring uh, with Shane yesterday. The Bill Show is on the road, Detroit. I got Brent Hall, y'all know Brent, right? I got Shane Overby. Now Brent and I are some Texas boys who have never been to Detroit and Shane's been here for a decade. He's actually a Michigan boy originally. I mean, there is a lot happening in the city, Shane. This is impressive. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the city's changed a lot in the last 10 years that I've been here. And where are we now? Which building is this? This is called the Element Hotel or the Metropolitan Building. Okay. And we are actually on the top floor, which is a penthouse bar restaurant called the Monarch. So we'll go inside and you can see everything that we did. But this was a complete historic restoration of the building that was built in 1918 to about 1920. Okay, so 100 year old building. When you walk into that lobby, I mean, that lobby feels like you're stepping back into time. Wow, look at this. Oh man, this is awesome. Wow. So Shane, this is uh, some pretty nice touch-up paint you did in here, but it doesn't look like there was much work to be done, right? I mean, when you walk in here, Brent, you think this is ju just a, a nice, you know, touch-up job, right? Well, you hear stories about Detroit and you see some of the ruins and stuff. 1920s, Gothic Revival, awesome details. I mean, how much did you have to do in here? We did a little bit more than touch-up paint. So <laughs> this, this building was in pretty bad shape and yeah. this lobby, you know, kind of took the brunt of it, so. Most of what you see is a replication of what was here. Originally. Is that right? So, so this isn't necessarily original. 
Not all of this is original. There are a lot of parts that are original, okay. but okay. it's not 100% original. So if you had, you know, in, in a restoration like this, you're taking 20% of original material and, you know, reproducing this? We're taking as much of the original material as we can salvage okay. and restoring it. If we can't salvage it, then we're replicating it in place. Okay. Yeah. The uh, level of detail is amazing. I mean, this you is must gorgeous. have really good craftsmen. Yeah, we, we've got great craftsmen. Virtuoso Design Build is our millwork company. They did a lot of what you see in here. They replicated all of these beams and corbels, yeah. all of the plaster, faux plaster cornice work and crown work. They did you got well. decorative paint too. I mean, yeah, we had an artist on this as well that did the canvases. We had to match those and also paint the faux um, limestone cornices in to kind of look like they were that does beg a good question though. Like, you know, Texas, we're Texas boys, Texas builders coming in to visit. And where I am in Austin, we don't have really any second generation tradesmen, uh, hardly. Pretty much everybody is a first generation tradesman. Are you working with some folks that are second or third generation, whether it's plumbers, electricians, painters, mechanical contractors, uh, or is pretty much like us, everybody's the first time they're doing it? Uh, honestly, they're all first generation. Okay. People. I mean, most of them. There might be a plumber here, plumber or two here and there that are second or third generation, but a majority of these guys that we use for this restoration are doing it for the first time yeah. or they're, you know, 10, 15 years into their career, sometimes more. Uh, but in general, they're all pretty young and it's really just kind of a matter of looking at what we need to do and figuring out how to do it. It's well, just a, and, and what I would say too is, you know, speaking as a remodeler, right? I remember when I got back from North Bennett Street studying historic preservation, I always looked at what we did was being 10 times harder than building a new house. Yeah. And, and I look at this and, you know, this is not, you know, nailing up crown mold, right? This no. is, it's just a, you know, an extra level of quality craftsmanship. I mean, that's the beauty of, and challenge of remodeling, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you take a custom home, most of those are stick built with, you know, wood frame construction. Well, it's very easy to nail stuff into if it's crown molding or attach a baseboard to it. I mean, buildings like this are, majority of them are masonry without any backing. So how do you attach wood and newer construction materials to older masonry products and get it to stick and not warp or potentially delaminate. So they may not be first generation, but they're certainly skilled, right? Yeah. Yep. And I think that's one of the big lessons that I'm looking forward to hearing more from you, Shane. I mean, when Brent and I walk into this lobby, uh, you know, I was joking about the touch of paint. This clearly it looks like it's 100 years old. And obviously, this is not all original and wasn't in pristine condition when you found it. Uh, so with that being said, guys, let's go back to the event. And we're going to let Shane spend a few minutes kind of talking through the lessons learned and how he got to this point that Brent and I can walk in and go, this is unbelievable. All right, guys, we'll see you back there. Man, great job, gentlemen. I appreciate y'all uh, taking the tour, Shane. I mean, it was, uh, it was really fun for Brent and I to see what you've got going on and see how you've uh, really made a name for yourself in this city in such a short amount of time. But you've got the clicker, you got some slides. Why don't you walk us through what that lobby, what that building looked like, what you had to do to bring it up to uh, the incredible level of craftsmanship that we saw uh, walking through that yesterday. Certainly. So let's start with some of these first few slides are just the condition of the building that it was in when the developers started the rehab. So this is the first one. We've got two parts that we're looking at. Part of this is that rooftop bar that you guys saw in the video. And then the other part is the lobby restoration. So what you're looking at here is actually up in the Monarch Club, the bar portion. So the building was in pretty bad shape. It had been vacant for I don't even know how many decades, but the roof was completely gone. There were trees growing on the roof. I mean, some of them were 10, 15 feet tall. The developers actually took one down as part of their like groundbreaking ceremony and planted it out in one of the parks, I guess. So, Did you have to get a tree permit to remove a tree? From I didn't have anything to do with that. So. In Austin, Texas, we would have probably had to get a permit. For that. Right. I think everyone in the city was happy to see the vegetation get removed from the roof. So this is representative of what this building looked like Oof. floor by floor as you go through it. Rough. Real rough. Yeah, the water will... The water will do a lot of damage. And obviously, it peeled a lot of the plaster off of the walls. Um, 
there was just a lot of rot. Any woodwork that had been in the building it had been. I think you have to turn it on. Keep going. I'll be your. Uh, I'll be your clicker. Yeah. So I mean, any of the woodwork you know that was there was so rotten you couldn't <laughs> salvage it. Um, I mean, the building was obviously obviously just in horrible shape. It was actually some people wanted to demolish this building and didn't think that it could be salvaged. And and for me as a residential guy, I'm used to only doing wood frame. Uh, this is a hundred year old building that looks to be concrete floors, concrete and steel infrastructure, and then. Those blocks you're seeing under those windows, that's just infill in between the, those are non-structural in other words, right? Correct, the whole building is steel post and beam construction, all wrapped in concrete. Um, and then the infill, like you said, is like a fire block or a fire brick that they used in the you know early 20s in a lot of the buildings down here. And then they would just plaster over that and you can see some of that plaster still attached, a lot has fallen off. Correct, then they would just plaster right over it. Got it. So just more interior pictures of the building. Uh, most of those were upstairs in the bar and the penthouse. This is actually the lobby. So <laughs> this is how it looked when we walked into it. You guys got a little bit of a glimpse of what it looked like as a finished product, but this is where it got challenging. So the main goal of this restoration was to make it look as original as possible. And so we had to walk in there and take anything that we could and replicate it. And we did get lucky that there was enough of the original material in each finished portion of that lobby area that we could take it apart and replicate it. So we had some wood beams and corbels that you'll see in a minute. And out of the 18 or 20 that were in there, only two of them were actually left up in place. And wow. we were lucky enough to be able to take those down and match them. And those two original ones actually went back into the lobby ceiling when it was all said and done. That's awesome. Yeah, we also had the wood beams up there and all of this had stenciling on it. So we've got a phenomenal millwork company that came in, took those pieces out, took it to their shop, replicated these, and then we sent it to an artist studio and he had to replicate the very detailed stenciling on it. All of that material came back out to the site. It got installed and, you know, there were several other portions to it, not just the wood portion, but we're trying to do all of this in the lobby of the building. There's a lot of other construction happening at the time. I mean, the elevator company was set up right where we're trying to roll our scaffolding around so that we can access all of these points to do this. You're work. in the choke point, right? Where everybody needs to get by and you need to do work on the ceiling with scaffold. That's pretty rough. Yeah, it was a, it was a difficult work environment, right? right in the main entrance to the building. So this is what it looks like now finished. We matched all the canvas paintings that were up there, patched and repaired all of the plaster. Um, we talked about it, that there was a limestone cornice going on around and a limestone crown molding going around. And we probably only had 10 feet, I would guess, of original material. Car limestone. Correct. Yeah, yeah. So what you're seeing there, that that's that kind of scrolled card work. That's not wood. That's actually limestone that was carved a hundred years ago. Well, originally, but not in this picture. Right. So we took that roughly ten foot section, created a mold, and then replicated new pieces out of styrofoam that have a polyurethane um, face to them to give them some rigid form, and then installed that. After that, we had another painter come in, and kind of touch that up so that it looked like it was worn to match the existing stuff. Wow. And even now it's very hard to tell where the old stuff was and where the new stuff is. That's amazing. Let me pause you for one second because Brent, you've done a lot of carved work. And in fact, you have a wood carver on your team that you got a green card from uh, where in Europe or visa card from rather, Ukraine from yeah. the Ukraine. Yeah. And he's doing wood carving on your staff. Uh, what would you have done in, in Fort Worth, let's say, if you had a carved piece? Would you have your guy recarve it? Would you take it somewhere? Any advice for people that are trying to, to do this on a national scale? Yeah, I mean, sometimes you're, uh, you're taking pictures. I mean, when you don't have uh, you know, product there, you're, you're taking a picture and doing the best you can. And you would create a mold, like he's saying. If he didn't have something to create a mold, you would carve a section so that that would become your mold. We ended up just doing that on a historic house where we needed new capitals and the other ones were gone. And so he carved a new capital from a picture and then we made a mold from that. So, wow. And yeah. then plaster right. uh, moldings were made from that mold in the Correct. future. That's amazing. How cool is that? Yeah. So a hundred year old limestone that was carved probably by a, a really skilled old Mason 
today we're able to replicate. Uh, and what I thought was cool was Brent, you know, you really are uh, an expert on this. He didn't walk in and immediately go, oh man, they faux painted this, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. We both were like, man, that molding's unbelievable. Really well done. Thank you. Really well done. Impressive. Is your clicker working by the way? Yeah, that's working. Yeah. Okay, cool. So this is, you know, just a good side by side of the before and after. Um, again, what we walked into, you can see some of the corbels on the top there that were existing that we took down and matched and put back up later. And I believe that arch on the right is still all the original. That that didn't get replaced. There's that arch again that that didn't get replaced. Golly, that's amazing. Yep, um, handrail as well. We had to rebuild this entire decorative handrail. All that metal had been stolen, scrapped, rusted to pieces years ago. Uh, wood top rail, all of it had to get replicated and made new. And we had, again, about a 10 foot section that we could match off of. And the metal fabricators could take that and use it as a template. That's really cool. This is actually where some of those first pictures that you saw were of the building. And so now it's a bar restaurant. The whole thing was built out to look the way it does now. It's got custom banquette seating. The whole thing turned out really well. It's all cherry wood. The bar itself is cherry. Back bar is cherry. Um, yeah, I'm just really happy with the way it turned out. When I was, uh, when we were on site, I asked you the question because I, I thought I knew the answer. And the question was, you know, I assume here in Detroit, you're all second and third generation plumbers, craftsmen, finished carpenters, you know, their grandpa started the business and now they're the grandson, granddaughter who's in the business. And your answer was not what I expected. I was totally caught off guard saying, look, no, most of my crew, most of the people that are out there uh, working as subcontractors, they're first generation. And that's kind of my experience in Texas. Uh, but I expected an old town like Detroit that's a, uh, you know, manufacturing hub to have lots of craftsmen from uh, from years ago that are teaching that younger generation. And uh, in some respects, I'm really uh, well, in many respects, I'm super proud of what you accomplished there. I mean, that really did look like a hundred year old Bobby with amazing craftsmanship. I'm also a little sad that I that my expectation of, oh, these other towns besides Austin have an old craftsmen that are handing down the craft is not really the case. What, what uh, this is a bigger talk than we have time for here, but what do you guys think about uh, training that next generation of craftsmen? Uh, and any thoughts on that after working here in Detroit for 10 years? You know, I don't know how to answer that. I mean, like I said earlier, most of our guys are all of our millwork company guys, all of our electricians, they're all in their 30s. I mean, late 20s. I don't I don't think that any one of them are over 40 in either of those crews. But on the other hand, it makes me go, man, I have a lot of faith in the next generation below us. You know, Brent and I are both in our 50s. Uh, we've been doing we've been doing this for a while. Uh, and, you know, there is that certain amount of, oh, we're going to hit a cliff. There's not young people that are going into the business. But yet some of the young folks that you're working with and that I'm working with are super, super talented, are very passionate about craftsmanship and are putting their best in every day and getting better year and year and year after year. Absolutely. I mean, there are young guys that I'm seeing in the trades that are able to, to do this. I don't know if there are enough of them, but these guys all, all put this entire building back together. One That's thing so I cool. would say is that um, to that point is, you know, Having a product like that where you have to figure it out raises your bar. Yeah, right? that's a good where, point. Where you have to look at it and go, hmm, how would I do that? Uh, that teaches you a lot when you have to kind of dig back into the past and figure it out. So I think it helps. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, in some ways, you know, it, it, it gives us a template to go off of. Yeah. We have to match what is there. We're not creating it from scratch. We're matching what is there. And yeah. it establishes a quality out. bar too, right? Absolutely. Yeah. That's pretty cool. I thought it was interesting too, this is a bit of a side note, but thinking about new technology, uh, you know, you've got pretty low ceilings because you've got concrete deck and concrete deck. You don't have a ton of space, uh, but they utilized, uh, and what I've seen all over Detroit really is uh, VRF technology, a lot of Mitsubishi, some Daikin, some LG, uh, like this unit that's in the photo here, which is recessed into the ceiling. And then there's a free online that goes to uh, a unit on the roof and that unit on the roof may be able to handle five, 10 heads like this at various locations. 
and you can actually variably heat and cool one part of the building separately with the same condenser on the roof uh, with some of these commercial products. And I'm using those in my residential buildings as well, including my own personal house. Yeah, VRF's a great tool, especially in these older buildings when you don't have a way to get from point A to point B easily with a lot of big ductwork. Yeah, all you need to do is snake that free online and figure out how to get the condensate out of there. Correct. Which condensate, I'm sure, is tough though sometimes. You have to pump it sometimes. <laughs> yeah, you gotta pump it. Amazing work, man. Beautiful, beautiful job. Thank you. Uh, Brent, let's go to you. I want to, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are uh, on one specialty of yours in particular, uh, which is windows and what you do in thinking about old windows versus new windows. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, we're in year 30 um, right now. We've got a millwork business as well as a home building business. Um, we build kind of big houses uh, for wealthy clients, so we're very thankful for that. Um, about I don't know, we've been doing it a while now, about five years ago on these projects that we'd worked on originally, the windows started rotting out. So we started looking at our commercial business, which was restoring windows like this. This is a courthouse in Texas, 1920s. Um, and uh, you have problems on these windows, whether it's the paint color, whether it's the, the wood quality or whatever else, they begin to you know, deteriorate and we're having to try to, you know, come up with solutions for uh, fixing these windows. Um, you know, this, this, these windows look terrible, but when we dug into them, it was all old growth uh, redwood. The wood was perfect. I mean, it was literally, we took the paint off and I mean, you could see, see the profiles, you could see everything still there. And so my argument is, is that, you know, uh, it, it all, isn't always just to throw them out. And it also isn't a, uh, um, you know, I can save so much money on my energy bills. Uh, I think the the lesson for this group here, and you guys have much cooler weather than we do, colder, um, is that we have a uh, window replacement isn't always the best thing. 50% um, of window replacements right now are going back into window replacements. And so, there is, they're not necessarily replacing historic windows uh, where you have an Indian village and historic designation that requires you to keep these historic windows. What do you do? And I think, you know, uh, you know, th these slides that I'm going to show, um, you know, kind of point to the problem and point to kind of some of the issues. One is if you consider the energy use and if you guys are required to put blower doors on your houses, you know that energy loss is going in chimneys, is going in any penetration you've got in your walls. And so the energy use on your energy bill, let's say it's a hundred dollars a month. I wish, right? Um, you've got, you know, 30 to $40 is, is on cooling and heating, right? And so not all of your energy bill is spent on heating and cooling. The other thing is that the energy loss in an historic building, only about 10 or 20% are going outdoors and windows. Mm. And so this is not a situation where you know, you stand in some of these old houses and you see, feel the air coming through the, the windows that haven't been weather stripped or just are leaky. And you go, gosh, I mean, if I replace these, it, it would it would make so much sense. Um, but the fact is, is that the the payback time that it's going to take on an energy bill uh, that you would get for replacing your windows. Let's say you have a house and you replace it. You know, it's thirty thousand dollars or twenty thousand dollars to replace the windows the time it takes for you to replace uh, to save that money and get it back is between 40 and 120 years depending on the house depending on the number of windows <laughs> well the problem is is that most new windows won't last 40 years or 120 years and so you're replacing them again so uh there's a lot of value i, I think appreciate you matt giving me the hardest topic to talk about <laughs> uh historic windows and replacing them and how to how to achieve it but there are other solutions to uh, energy efficiency and making them work well. The thing is, is that window replacement is easy, an easy sell, right? Mm -hmm. Because everybody has heard the stories about, you know, save 50% on your energy bills. The FTC came out and said, you can't say that anymore. That's just not a true statement. Mm -hmm. There is a, this quote I have, uh, I don't have, um, was from an energy consultant that's usually between one and 4% of a savings by replacing your windows. So, Anyway, our business, uh, majority of our business is 
window replacement, uh, you know, and and you know how to do that effectively. And what we're typically telling our homeowners is, look, don't spend 20, 30, 50, whatever thousand dollars on windows. Let's let's work on your uh, weather strip in your windows. Let's work on insulation in the walls. I mean, if you've got a pre-1940 house, you most likely don't have insulation in the house. Mm -hmm. And so putting things like that are much better bang for your buck than window replacement. We don't have time for uh, a four hour seminar on this, but <laughs> Brent could give us a four hour seminar on this. There are but I would direct you over to buildshownetwork.com. Check out Brent's videos. I mean, uh, Brent's millwork company makes a product called the 100 year window. Uh, made from really excellent wood, made with a lot of craftsmanship. You've got how many craftsmen actually on staff at Hell Millwork? 30? Yeah. 30 people? Mm -hmm. 30 craftsmen on staff at his mill workshop that are making gorgeous windows and doors. Uh, we've shot some videos together at a house in Baton Rouge that had a house full of your windows and doors. So uh, there's a lot more on this topic that Brent could dive into and has dove into in his videos. If you're not following Brent's work, go check him out on buildshownetwork.com. Uh, his Instagram feed. Uh, let's switch to uh, not the windows, but the install. And here's where I get to get nerdy for a minute. Uh, the topic today was uh, new construction and what we do on remodels that we that we might learn from new construction. And uh, Brent and I are pretty similar in that we do new homes and we do remodels. And so I'm always looking at how could I do uh, remodels better. In Shane's world that you live in uh, is the kind of commercial world. And there's a lot of interesting practices and tools that I've kind of grabbed from the commercial world. And this is one of them. A couple years ago, I drove by this house. Drove by this house. It was a house with a zip system sheathing. And it's a little hard to tell from the zoomed away photo, but it had recessed windows. You familiar with that look? It's like, hey, we're trying to, uh, to make the window look like it's recessed back in the opening. And the, the builder had done a terrible job of it. And I've got a full video on it. But the point is, using traditional methods in recessed windows is very difficult. And this is when I kind of first found out about fluid applied uh, flashings. And this gray one happens to be Huber's version. They call it liquid flash. Uh, there's a bunch of different options out there, including the blue one, which is made by Polywall. But in effect, it's a caulking, for lack of a better term, that also acts as an adhesive. Uh, and you're able to uh, paint it on, kind of, or caulk it on. And it because it has adhesive properties, it'll stick to all your major building materials. It'll stick to concrete and plywood and zip sheathing and uh, tar paper and other things. And so we ripped out a couple windows out of this house that, on new construction and showed this builder how to use these fluid applied flashings. And we used two different flavors just to kind of see, or two different manufacturers to see what they look like. But it got me thinking, you know, I wonder if I could take that same technology and put that into my remodels, you know, cause we did, we do have done a lot of uh, uh, remodel window replacements. Now I'm not usually working on historic projects. I'm usually working on relatively new uh, projects, you know, from the seventies, let's say a newer, Austin doesn't have a lot of uh, beautiful 100 year old houses. Uh, we just didn't have any uh, money, but this is a pretty typical house. In fact, this is one of my neighbor's houses. Uh, this is around the corner from where I built my house. 70s construction. Uh, and when you look at this house, the first thing I think is, uh, you know, I'm kind of thankful this is a one story house with an overhang because that means automatically this is not a house probably that's going to have a lot of problems. You know, a lot of things are solved by having an overhang and having a one story house. Uh, more and more today, builders, new construction builders, production builders are building two story houses with six inch overhangs or two or three story houses or condos with no overhangs. Now those are exposed houses, but a seventies house with an overhang and a vented roof, maybe not quite as much exposure, but we got a brick facade. We've got wood framing. And on this project, uh, uh, my neighbor, who's a buddy of mine said, hey, I'm replacing my windows. Will you help me? Uh, I just want to make sure that my contractor kind of does it the best practice. And I said, yeah, I'm glad to meet the contractor, met the guy, great guy, and was willing to let me kind of uh, consult for lack of a better term on it. So the first thing we did was we're trying to figure out what's, what's the type of construction that we're dealing with? Because that is a big deal. You know, on Shane's projects, if you've got mason, full masonry exteriors on the building, uh, if one of his windows that he installs leaks, number one, will anyone ever know? Maybe not. Number two, will anything get harmed? 
Probably not. I mean, if there's cinder block underneath that window, or not cinder block, you've got that speed block, I guess they speed call it, block, fire and fire. real plaster, there's a lot of, uh, pardon my super nerdiness, but there's a lot of hydric buffer capacity, which is a super fancy way to say there's a lot of ability to soak up water and not have a problem. New construction, uh, you know, wood framing with, uh, you know, OSB sheathing, doesn't take much water for there to be rot and problems on those houses. So when you look at a remodel and you look at the windows, there's not a lot you can tell about how the house is built when you look at this close up. All you know is we got a brick facade, it's probably wood framing, and these are not uh, Brent Hall's cool windows. These are single pane, aluminum, crappy 70s windows in Texas, which pretty much every 70s built Texas house unfortunately used minus maybe three in the state in the, in the whole <laughs> decade of the 70s. So uh, we want to kind of try and figure out what's happening behind there uh, before we get to doing the window replacement. So in this house, I wish I had a further picture back, but it had some, um, had some siding on the back of the house. And I said to the contractor, hey, what's happening with the siding? Uh, and he said, well, we're going to replace it. And so we were able to figure out pretty quickly, this house had uh, tar paper on studs, no sheathing. Uh, and then the brick uh, ties were basically nailed through the tar paper. And that's pretty normal in a 70s house. We have lead embracing. I suspect you guys have a lot of that in the 70s and 80s uh, in Michigan as well. In fact, I was talking to somebody uh, earlier today who said they had a house like this that they were remodeling. So here's what's cool. That fluid applied flashing will stick to almost all these building materials and adhere to it. So what we did was we pulled the the brick off where the flange was gonna go, allowed us to get to the windows and pop them right out, no big deal. And then we grabbed some uh, fluid applied flashing just like we would in new construction. And this happens to be Prosico's fast flash product. And what you're seeing here is now the windows out, that tar paper was just like that from the 70s. So this is uh, you know 50 year old tar paper and they'd cut the tar paper right at the rough opening. And so we're able to basically use that fluid applied flashing on the entire opening uh, around that window. And you've probably seen me do this, so I don't want to belabor the point. It's not uh, super difficult, but it's a, uh, a product that you're able to kind of zigzag out and then smooth down either with a chip brush, which is what you're seeing in the foreground there, or with uh, you know some type of a flexible spatula. Actually, a better product to use is a Bondo scraper. You know, those are those flexible Bondo scrapers. And you're basically gonna paint the entire rough opening with this fluid applied flashing. It sticks tenaciously to wood. It sticks really, real, really, really well to tar paper. What it doesn't stick to uh, is white uh, plasticky house wraps. So be cautious about that. If you're gonna stick onto a white house wrap, you need to use their um, flashing tape that does stick to that house wrap and then go onto the flashing tape. So if you had a, uh, a white house wrap on the house, get their flashing tape, usually it's a butyl based tape, stick that on first and then fluid applied over top of that because it won't stick uh, to the house wrap. And you can pretty much test this yourself uh, by getting whatever building material you're thinking about sticking to, apply that fluid applied flashing, whatever flavor you're gonna use, let it sit for a day and then see if you can peel it off. And if it destroys the substrate by peeling it off, you got a good product, we got a good bond. If it peels right off and there's no damage to the substrate, then it's not sticking well. You don't wanna use that. In tar paper's case, you're gonna rip all the fibers off the tar paper. So it is uh, peelable. It's not like it's uh, as tenaciously stuck as it would be to concrete or wood, but it sticks pretty darn well to tar paper in my experience. So now it's really just the same process uh, installing a window as we would in new construction. We're gonna kind of paint over the uh, nailing flanges uh, we're going to also make sure we take really good care of the corners. There's several manufacturers that do these corner pads. I'm not a fan of those. Uh, no offense to this manufacturer, um, but I wish they didn't have them. This is a flexible flange and you have to put that corner pad. Otherwise there's a big uh, kind of hole in that corner where the, uh, where the two flanges flap up. So put those corner pads on and then goo over those corner pads with your fluid applied flashing. And if you've seen my videos before, you know that I'm a big fan of leaving that bottom um, flange open. You don't want to cock that shut. And in fact, I even purposely take a couple of horseshoe shims. And before we nail that flange, we pop a couple of horseshoe shims in there just to shim it out of the air. So if there were any water that were to get past there, 
it's got a weep path out of the building. And this method could be used in really just about any form of construction. You could use it on Shane's projects where you've got masonry. You can use this on wood. You could use this on steel framing if you had a, you know, a newer commercial job that you were doing this type. It's a really, really cool product category uh, that I really like. Don't forget your head flashes, guys. Always got to put your head flashes on. Uh, and this will also stick to stainless or other metals, so you're good to go on that. And there's your finished window. Really, really straightforward, ready for the mason to come in uh, and brick that over. The last step on this process, so don't forget, is you need that air sealing on the inside. Just like Brent talked about how leaky uh, windows often are, it's not always the window. Oftentimes, it's the connection between the window and the trim that's leaking. And so you want to do a really good job of connecting that window frame uh, to the rough opening. And there's a bunch of ways you could do that. You could use Big Stretch, uh, you could use Prosigo Air Dam, but you want to make sure you've got a really flexible caulking product and you don't want to fill that cavity. What I don't show here is there's a backer rod in there. Anytime you're, you're caulking a joint, whether it's a small joint or a wide joint, put a backer rod in there first. That backer rod acts as a bond break. So if that window uh, frame and jam sees some movement, that caulking can do its thing and move without cracking. If it's bonded to the backside, it's gonna crack and break off one of the sides. So um, yeah, so that's, that's how I do a window replacement in a relatively, in, in the scheme of things, new building, a 50 year old building compared to a 100 year old building. Uh, that's it for slides. Um, but one thing that I wanted to mention uh, when we've got about a couple minutes before Q&A, by the way, if you're watching this live uh, and you have a question, pop your questions on the Q&A tab uh, on the Zoom uh, link. So that's where I'll actually be seeing your questions. Um, but one thing I was thinking about earlier with you, Shane, that I think is so interesting, and, and Brent, you made this comment. Uh, you know, I've, I've kind of built my business with Instagram and with YouTube, and uh, I'm, you know, I do a lot of social media, uh, as nerdy as that sounds, but you, Shane, I would, I would consider you the classic contractor who's really almost 100% referral based and frankly is very under the radar. Do you remember us talking about this yesterday? Yeah, I mean, it, it's impressive. And I think that if I was a young remodeler just starting out, I'd look at a mat and, and might have some Insta envy, right? And so right. The, you know, these guys, <laughs> There's a lot of things I'm saying there, and uh, but but having this this oh my gosh, well that's what I've got to do to be you know successful. And what was impressive about going around with you is it's very clear that you have built a reputation on quality and and performance and you know taking care of a customer, and that's number one. If you can do that, you don't need. He didn't even have an Instagram handle until yesterday. So, but go uh, follow him on Instagram. Yeah. He has a handle as of as of 24 hours ago. So it's impressive. It's it's it means that you've you're focused on the right things and uh, you know taking care of the customer first. I heard him say that a number of times, as opposed to trying to find a video that can go viral or or you know a post right. that can go viral. You start chasing the wrong things. 100%. Would yeah. you, I know this is a little embarrassing to talk about, but <laughs> would you talk for a minute about your kind of 10 year history of being back in Detroit or being in Detroit? I know you're from Michigan originally, but uh, what you don't know is that Shane uh, was a builder in Montana for many years and then moved back here about a decade ago. Talk to us about how you built your business because you're not on Instagram. You didn't even have a website until just very recently. What's your secret to, uh, to building that business base? Uh, I had a website. I just hadn't hit the publish button. <laughs> yeah, one of my developers gave me a hard time about it for months, and finally hit the publish button. And then 24 hours ago, got on the Instagram. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I think your reputation is just really important. I think doing what you say you're going to do and following through is just the most important part. And obviously, yeah. a, a good referral speaks much better than any piece of marketing, in my opinion. Um, we were talking to one of the guys earlier before the show started, and he just sounds like he's very honest with his clients or potential clients, and he tries to manage their expectations right up front so that they aren't disappointed in the end. I think that there's a lot to be said about that, just being forthcoming and saying, here's what you should expect. And like one of you guys said, I forget which one, you're educating the client on what to expect, how to do it and how it's going to go. And if you manage your expectations up front and then follow through with that, you usually end up with a successful project. Yeah, that's a great point. 
Yeah. Brent, how have you built your business? Because I know you you have a big Instagram following, but you haven't always. And my assumption is you're not pulling in new clients from an Instagram post, right? Uh, yeah. They're coming to you in other ways. Yeah, uh, I mean, when we started, there wasn't Instagram, and uh, probably when most of us started. The, uh, uh, I mean, I'm ADD. The reason I have two businesses is I can't stay focused on one thing at a time. <laughs> and so I, I have the millwork business and the building thing. I love building, I love doing all that. I think if you ask my clients, the things they like about me is passion. Okay, and I get excited about craft. I get excited about building cool things. I look at them and I say, we got a great opportunity here. I'm one of those contractors who goes into the client's house and go, wow, this is awesome, I'm excited. And the number of times I've heard them say, you're the first contractor that said that. Uh, and I'm not BSing them, I'm really excited about their projects. We get called for some cool things. But I've heard other contractors go in and go, well, we got a lot of problems here. You know, and you're just like, Anyway, I, I love what I do. I, I'm passionate about it. And so I would say that if I was gonna nail it down to one thing, it might be that. I totally agree with you, Brennan. And in fact, I've heard that same uh, comment from clients is that I got the job because I was interested in it. Yeah. Uh, you know, as a builder or a model or a contractor, uh, that process of courting a client is a little like dating, right? If you, if you, if I were to ask my wife out on a date and I was like, ah, you know, maybe you around this weekend, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> I got some other girls I'm talking to too, but maybe I'm free Saturday. Do you think she'd go out with you? No, like I was serious about like, Christy is beautiful. I need to really pursue this girl if she's gonna be interested in this dorky Matt. Uh, and so true. I went after true. her. That's it is true. true, she's really pretty. Uh, so the same goes with clients, right? If you're, if it's a cool job, you gotta tell them you want the job. And I always consciously think when I'm ending a meeting with a prospect, I really try and look them in the eye and shake their hand and go, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Prospect, this is a really cool project. I would really like to build this uh, with you guys. I think we'd have a lot of fun. I think we'd build a really cool project together. And I think we could really nail the details together. So I really hope that you'll consider hiring me on but this. But notice the things he's not saying. He's not saying I can, you know, beat everybody else's price. Mm -hmm. He's not saying, you know, uh, you know, He's not saying it, it's, uh, I'm gonna be the cheapest, I'm gonna be the fastest. Yep. He's saying we're gonna build something great here. Yeah, 100%. And that's also important. 100%. Um, let's switch to uh, a couple Q and A's. Uh, and then I actually have a couple Q and A's for you guys too, because as you as you both were talking, I had a few more questions about it. Um, but we're at uh, quarter till, so let me hit a couple. Uh, this, one's for, this one's for you, Shane, I would say. Hey guys, at what point when trying to save something original, Actually, both of you all can answer this. At what point when you try and save something original, do you decide it's going to be better to scrap it and go with something brand new? Does it come down to financial costs? What's gonna look the best or what the client chooses? How would you guys answer that? I would say it's all three of those. It depends on how much you have left there to salvage. And the first question is, is there enough here to salvage? Is there enough that we need to scrap this and replicate? Um, if you're going to salvage it, I think the question you should ask is, are you going to end up with a quality finished product? This is something that the client's going to be happy with. And if you're unsure of the answer, ask them and say, I'm not confident that I can deliver a perfect finished product with this because it's too far gone. I think that we should replace it. Yeah. I'd say too that uh, on some preservation jobs, which you're on too, um, the historic preservation officer requires you to keep a certain amount of historic fabric mm -hmm if something's rotten that will say, no, we'd like you to keep that. Now that's hasn't changed, that's changed a little bit from when I was in school where there was just like, you gotta keep everything possible. Um, but I'd also, the other thing I'd add is that I think things that were built, you know, hundred years ago, in many cases have this intuitive design in them, like a pitch sill on the bottom of a window, mm -hmm. right? And I, I think that some reason, sometimes the reason we started making you know, plastic and concrete products is because we forgot how to pitch the sill on the window. <laughs> and so uh, I think there's a lot of building it so it lasts again, right, is, isn't really important. And, and a side question of that, which actually I think is related to your talk, Brent, is, you know, if you get a call from a client who, who uh, has an older building and wants to replace their windows, you know, they want to put some new windows in. How do you talk them through that process? Well, actually, you know, what we could do instead of replacing them is this. Uh, you know, we could do uh, a full 
pull out, remodel, uh, replace weather strip, what, whatever. How do you, talk me through how you talk about that with clients. Well, I mean, I, I, I listen to them very carefully. If they're saying, uh, you know, some guy told me I could save all the kinds of money, you know, the, doing this, then I'm educating them on that's not really true. Um, most of our clients would want to keep the original windows. We love our window originals, they're, but they're falling apart or whatever the thing is. And so we are usually approaching that, you know, per that first question, you know, we're not just tearing out the window, putting a new window in, but we might replace the sill. We might give them new sash. We might, you know, update and restore the window as opposed to putting new in. But um, yeah, I mean, it just varies depending on what the client, I mean, we were talking to Ken earlier and uh, it is about educating the client. It is about, about everything, about windows, about costs, about, you know, why do they want to do that? And so not a best answer you're looking for, but it's no, just, it's just, uh, it's nuanced, right? Yeah, like it anything is. In it our really business. is. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you a hard question. Uh, what's it cost? Uh, you know, if we were, if we were going to uh, pull out a hundred year old, 75 year old window and put a new wood double hung clad or unclad window in versus maybe taking out those original single glazed windows, refurbing them, reglazing them, putting new brass weather stripping in, cleaning up the hardware. Is there, is it a uh, one-to-one -one kind of uh, cost or is there a huge difference in disparity? In our in market, it's two to one. So we start restoring a window at about $1,500 a window. Our new hundred year window, which is built like they were built a hundred years ago, uh, is about $3,000, $3,500. There you go. So I love it. And that's that's not just any window. I mean, that's that's a window that's Sapile, is that right? Yeah, it's a kick-ass window, man. It's a pretty awesome window. <laughs> you got to see his videos on that. It's pretty, I think it's called the 100 year window, right? Yeah, is, is the name of the video. Uh, and I and I have that on my YouTube and we've got it on builtionnetwork.com. What about you in this Detroit market? Do people, is that is that a number you have on the top of your head like Brent has? Uh, not off the top of my head. We've been lucky enough in most projects to um, be able to breathe life back into the windows and restore them. Occasionally we have to replace a sash or two, uh, but it's not the end of the world. It's not a total rebuild like he's talking. We did have one project, a hotel, that they were all original wood windows and Builders First Source supplied us with a gelled wind wood window that met all of the historic district standards for that project. So that was a total replace, but we didn't have enough sashes, frames, or anything in there to even think about salvaging it. All we had to do was pull one or two sashes um, and match the profiles on those. So we didn't even really go down the road of restoration on those windows. Got it. All right, another question for you. Uh, are you cost plus versus fixed price? And what do you do when you run into the unexpected on these old remodels? And I think they're, I think in a lot of respects, they're talking to you, Shane, about your uh, that lobby and all, I mean, walking into that graffiti filled, uh, you know, homeless camp looking lobby, that's pretty hard to estimate that. And, and so are you mainly cost plus? Are you mainly fixed price? And how do you estimate those unknowns? So pretty much all of our projects are commercial. And so everyone wants to see a GMP contract, which is a guaranteed maximum price. Um, most of these larger jobs are bank funded and the bank wants to make sure that we're not gonna go over budget. So what I do to protect ourselves is we price everything out as closely as we can, but then we also put a contingency in there for sure so that we are covered in case we do run into some unexpected conditions. Uh, but we try to lay everything out. We have a very well-written scope of work that goes line by line, matches our budget. And so we say, for electrical, we're putting in 10 lights and here's what it's going to cost you. And here's the light that we're putting in. This is the spec. And we just say, this is what we are pricing. That way I feel like we're covered if we go over. If all of a sudden we need to put 12 lights in, well, that's going to cost more because we're putting 12 lights in when we priced out 10. So I just try to be very clear about what we are pricing. And Setting. if there are unknowns saying, I don't know what this is going to happen. Here are the, the areas that I'm nervous about. Setting really good expectations Correct. is what I'm hearing you say. That's really smart. How about you, Brent? Cost plus versus, uh, versus fixed price. <clears throat> and then with either contract, how do you deal with those unexpected unknowns that always happen on a remodel? Yeah, well, I mean, you got to remember on commercial jobs, you have, you know, a set of plans and a spec book. Mm -hmm. So everything should be spec'd out. So you are uh, 
you know, trying to, you were bidding off a, it's not like you have an unknown, at least on a lot of our projects. Uh, and and we're, we're the same way. We're, we've kind of got a, a fixed price. We've already talked to the architect. We've already talked to the contractor. We've told them where they are. Sometimes we talk to the owner and told them about the price expectation. So typically before the job starts, the architects already talked to someone and has a budget mm -hmm. that, you know, that the homeowner or the, the county owner, the state owner is expecting. And so we help ourselves, you know, uh, as far as price expectation by sharing it pretty openly. Um, on the residential side, we, we are cost plus. We, we talked to, talk to somebody about that. Um, and we have a sliding scale, you know, uh, oh, any job under half a million dollars is cost plus 25%. Mm -hmm. And any, you know, and then if it gets to over $10 million, it's cost plus 17 and a half. So sliding scale. That's but really it, similar but, to me as well. But everything's cost plus. Almost the same. Yeah. Uh, so then cost plus jobs. What do you do when you run into, you know, hey, I took this apart and this isn't at all what I figured for estimates, Mr. Client? Yeah, uh, I mean, you, if you haven't educated them very well about potential problems, like I was talking to a client yesterday, it was a duplex they converted into a single family house and she's got a electrical panel on the first floor and one on the second floor and she wants us to tie them together. And we're like, I have no idea but that's behind that wall. And until we open it up, we're not, but I've established, I go, look, I've got $10,000 in there to electrical to tie this together, possibly new service, whatever else, but we don't know. And so by telling her that when we get into an unknown, we can, you know, I've, I've educated her that we've got a, you know, uh, an unknown there that, that could cost her a lot of money. Yeah. And what we do is I always have a contingency line on them on all my budgets. Uh, and it varies a little bit. Sometimes on new construction, it's smaller. Although these days I'm up it because the uh, the last two years of contingencies have been blown. Uh, but we used to say we were putting five percent on new construction and anywhere from ten to twenty percent on remodel. And that's not restoration or hundred year old projects. I'm talking remodels of you know fifty year old houses, let's say. Um, but then we would do a, I do cost plus as well. But I always do a change order for anything that happens, even if it's a zero dollar change order, meaning, hey, we ran into more electrical work than we expected. We're pulling this ten thousand dollars out of contingency and moving it to electrical. Here you go, Mr. Klein. I wanted to inform you of that and sign off on this. But that's a, a communication tool, right? That's right. You're, you're establishing expectations through that process. So that's you right. don't come to the end of the job and go, oh, by the way, it's two hundred fifty thousand dollars more than you thought. Yeah, I've done that before. It doesn't go over well. <laughs> Those conversations I've, I've lost fun. on that one. Uh, and I Me also, uh, as a side note, did a G did, I've only done one GMP and I lost my shirt on it. It was a, I don't know, 80 year old project. Uh, and I had a client that was really intent on uh, not signing change orders. And even though I presented change orders, he said, no, I mean, you should have figured that it says right here on this, this or this and the plans that that's in there. And so I ran into my GMP before we even finished framing. Uh, and I paid Dang. for the last, I don't know what, $75,000 on the project out of my own pocket in 2010 when I didn't have two nickels to rub together. Uh, I learned a hard lesson on that one. Uh, That's a hard lesson. Uh, the other lesson to learn on that one, which is a total side note, is uh, you know, don't marry a client. Don't get married if, if you don't think they're going to be a good marriage partner, right? You wouldn't marry a girl on one date without getting to know them and understand them. Uh, the same with your clients. I mean, as much as you want the job, you need to make sure that they're going to be a good partner in that process as well. This is new construction. This is remodel, whatever. You really need to vet your clients and make sure that they're going to be a good partner in the process. Well, and to that point, if I, if I was going to give one piece of advice to a guy starting out, I'd say pick good clients. Well, how do you pick good clients? You've had bad clients and you come to recognize those people that you want to avoid. Yeah, unfortunately, there's that little thing called wisdom and gray hair that that uh, is hard to get without yeah. getting it yourself. Yeah. But frankly, that's why Brent and I make videos because we've we've made a lot of mistakes. We've gotten a lot of gray hair, uh, and we're trying to uh, help you as our builder friends. And uh, you know, just I, I said this earlier, but just spending two days with Shane, uh, I didn't know you. I had no idea who you were. Builders First Source connected us, uh, and we spent yesterday touring. I feel like you're one of my old buddies because our our industry is so similar, right? Uh, that you watch my videos, you feel like you know me. It's because you're in the same business. You know what I go through on a daily basis. You know the hassles 
that we face. We know, you know, the subcontractor issues, the supply issues, the getting paid issues or not, or I'm not being paid. What do I do issues? Uh, I think there's a certain camaraderie that comes uh, from being in this industry that you can meet another builder from a thousand miles away or whatever we are from Texas and automatically have a friendship and know that you're dealing with the exact same things. You guys, any closing uh, thoughts? We're coming up to our hour time frame here. Already? Already. Yeah. It's been an hour already. Wow. It's Went good back. stuff. Shane, we really appreciate you being yeah, super sure. open with your time with us yesterday. You gave us just about a whole day of your time to tour. Yeah. Really kind of you, man. No, I appreciate you guys coming into town. I've had a great time touring around with you. It's been very fun. Glad you got to see Detroit. Glad that it wasn't what you expected. It wasn't. It totally way. exceeded all our expectations. This yeah. is a kick butt town. If you're watching this on the interwebs, come to Detroit, man. This would be a great place to hang out with your wife or your girlfriend for a weekend uh, sure. and uh, see the sights. Cool hotels, great restaurants. What was the name of the pizza place we had the other day? Moots's. Moots Pizza. That was the best pizza I've had in a long time. And we actually have a great Detroit pizza place and awesome. Uh, but man, it was so fabulous. So, so good. Nice. All right, for those of you that uh, are watching this later on the pre-recorded, remember, you can sign up, you can ask your questions. I saw all the questions that came through and was able to actually answer those questions for you. And if we have a live event in your town, we'd love to have you come join us for a live event, just like uh, this builder remodeler crew that we've got here in the, in the uh, live studio audience. Brent, amazing man, I really appreciate your time. Go follow Brent on Instagram and go check out his videos on Build Show Network. And Shane, in your 24-hour uh, uh, Instagram feed, we'll put a link to that below wherever Perfect. you're watching this. Go follow Shane and his cool work. We're going we're gonna to push you to uh, put something out there uh, just so that your builder friends can commiserate with you on their cool projects, which is what I like about Instagram is my network of friends around the country that I've made uh, in the same industry. But uh, with that being said, guys, uh, huge thanks to Builders First Source for putting together. This is a big deal. There's a lot of time and effort uh, there was a lot of money spent. This is a really, really cool event, and we really appreciate them uh, having us into Detroit. If you're not currently a BFS client, a customer, you're not a builder with them, they got some really, really good people. I've been working with them since around 2002 uh, when I was working in the Pacific Northwest and have been a client, I've been a builder uh, with BFS ever since. Uh, and you probably know this, but BMC merged with BFS, builder, uh, you know, Builders First Source and BMC merged like a year or two ago. So if, that, if, that's, uh, if you didn't understand that, all the BMC locations have changed their name to Builders First Source. Uh, and they're now one very cool, very large company with yards like at 500 some locations around the US. Uh, and they're also really big on the remodel side of the business. And it's totally different than buying from the big box stores. Don't spend your money uh, at the big box stores. Buy a tube of caulk or duct tape from them, sure. But you need a window package, you need a trim package, you need your framing. Uh, any of those things that I buy from them, you should be buying that from Builders First Source and not from some crappy national company that's gonna give you terrible service. Drop your uh, finished goods on the front yard of your client's house. Deal with these guys, find a really good local rep. Uh, that person that I have back in Austin is a big partner in my business. And I'm texting Doug all the time for things that I need. And I, I know Shane was doing the same thing uh, with his local BFS people. So huge thanks to those guys for sponsoring. It's bldr.com is their website. So you can find that local yard. Guys, that's it. Follow us on Twitter or Instagram. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on The Build Show.